so often in the health and fitness world, it's only talked about that diet and exercise control your metabolism. But so many people are doing diet and exercise to a T and still having trouble with their metabolism. So let's talk about this from a different angle. What if the eye was absolutely crucial in how our metabolism performed? Stay tuned to this episode to be convinced of this information. Welcome back, my friends. My name is Sarah. I am known as Carnivore Yogi. Thank you so much for being here and clicking on today's video. Today, I have a quantum eye surgeon, Dr. Jacob Montgomery, who I think you guys are going to absolutely love. This information in this episode is just so valuable, and this episode is packed full of valuable facts I think are going to absolutely blow your mind. We talk about as I mentioned in the intro, how the eye actually does help to control the metabolism and our overall health. Now, Dr. Montgomery had quite a health crisis himself in his early 40s and was insulin resistant even while following a low carb diet and doing CrossFit. His health absolutely fell apart. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring him on and talk today because like I mentioned in the intro, a lot of people have the diet and exercise down to a T and end up losing their health. So we have to dig deeper. I hope you guys enjoy this conversation. Please leave me a comment below. I would love to get the doctor back on again sometime to talk. He's very busy, he's a surgeon and he has four children. So it was awesome that he actually sat down and talked with me for this episode. I also wanted to mention, I am having a webinar all about nutrition this Sunday, February 13th. If you cannot attend live, you can get a replay if you sign up. And we're gonna go over a lot of the things that Dr. Montgomery and I talk about in this episode as it goes towards nutrition. I also have a replay of a webinar that I did in January, Building Your Perfect Quantum Day. That's available for you guys in the information section below where I take you through a day from sunup to sundown and help you implement all the things that Dr. Montgomery and I talk about in this episode, regardless as if, if you have kids or a job, or you just think these things are really hard for you to do. That's why I had that very first webinar because I wanted to help people implement these strategies in, in a very, very simple way. So make sure you check out the information section. There are also timestamps in the information section so you can go through this episode and go through the different topics, navigate through. And I have those timestamps thanks to my two sponsors. My first sponsor is going to be Optimal Carnivore. This is their grass-fed beef liver supplement. My discount code is carnivore uppercase Y to save 10% on this. And they have a grass-fed organ meat complex. Absolutely love this supplement and give it to myself and my family on a daily basis. As you'll hear in this episode, organ meats are vital and crucial to our health. We have a whole section on that. You can check the information section out if you wanna skip right to it. But this is my go-to source for organ meats. The second sponsor of today's show is Upgraded Formulas. This is their magnesium. I also love their potassium, and I currently utilize their hair tissue mineral analysis for myself as well as for my clients. I do recommend getting a consultation with that. You can use my code YOGI12 just to check in on your mineral status. It's always better to test and not guess when it comes to supplementation, guys. All right, I hope that you enjoy today's episode. Leave me a comment below and I'll talk with you again soon. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming back and tuning into the show. I am very excited about today's guest. I have a quantum eye surgeon with me and his name is Dr. Jacob Montgomery. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, my pleasure. This will be fun. Yeah, this is so exciting. I found your talk on YouTube. I think a lot of us have come across that talk. And one of the things that struck me, number one, your healing journey is just amazing. But one of the things that you said was <laughs> I was doing a ketogenic diet and I was sick and your health just had kind of fallen apart. Um, you were still insulin resistant and you're in this position as a doctor. So I would love to hear about that journey um, and how yeah. you got to where you are. So just for, for background, I'm a traditionally trained ophthalmologist. I've uh, been doing eye surgery for probably about 22 years now and was have always 
well, I would say always, but probably since my mid twenties been relatively interested in health pursuits. Um, and I really did, I began Atkins diet when it originally came out. So that's how long ago I was into low carb and I, I didn't really have any problems until I was probably in my mid thirties, but you have to understand that what I do for a living involves a lot of working through a microscope. And so there's a lot of artificial light, very high intensity light. And we typically, if we're gonna have longer surgeries, we do protect the patient's eyes with filters, but we often do not protect the surgeon's eyes because we don't think that way in ophthalmology. We, we don't think that light uh, ha can have a deleterious effect. And so for me, um, even doing Atkins, which, which really evolved into a low carb paleo, probably in my mid thirties, um, I became insulin resistant, uh, but that was, that was really kind of the minor problem. I also had pretty severe migraines, insomnia. Uh, I then developed a vestibular cochlear neuritis, uh, which is a pretty severe form of chronic Meniere's and nobody really had any answers, but I, I'm really starting to even talk to a disability, uh, insurance agent about, because, you know, I was having a hard time just getting up and going to work every day. And, wow. you know, I'm, I'm taking probably seven prescription medicines, lots and lots of supplements. I'm trying to figure this out because traditional medicine is not working for me. And it's interesting that, you know, I'm eating probably when I'm doing, when I was doing true low carb, I was less than 50 carbs a day, but I mean, I would say on average, probably 50 to 75. So low carb ish uh, with uh, the paleo and, and I wasn't overweight, but my insulin uh, resistance was very obvious to me and my traditional medical doctor. And, and so the question is, how does someone that's eating 50 carbs a day have an A1C over six? Wow. And it's like, that, that makes no sense. Not, and I had some other markers that were a little puzzling. My sed rate was a little higher. I was just inflamed a lot. And I'm working out a lot. I'm staying just chronically inflamed, overuse injuries. Uh, besides you were doing CrossFit, right? Yeah, I did CrossFit for a long time. I've backed off on that now. I, I, I can tell you what I do now, yeah. but there, there's more to the story. And it's really about the light environment that I was working in. I didn't have a clue because there's really no training that ophthalmologists get on the, uh, you know, the deleterious effects of artificial light. And, and that kind of led me down a pathway. I, I actually, to be honest with you, I, I realized that my problem was most likely mitochondrial dysfunction. I found a Dr. Doug Wallace, who's at the Children's Hospital, uh, and he's the guy in Philadelphia. He's the guy who really has studied mitochondria for probably three decades. Um, we're kind of hoping he's going to win the Nobel Prize so we can shed some light on this and get you know more uh, funding for our mitochondrial research. But I was convinced that the mitochondrial dysfunction was where my problem was uh, neurologically. And so I went down that rabbit hole and, you know, I really couldn't find, I was taking a bunch of supplements to try to boost mitochondrial health. And it wasn't really until I found uh, Jack Cruz's work, who I think a lot of people know uh, in this space. And I didn't believe a, a damn thing he said, to be honest with you, when I first read, because I'm a traditional ophthalmologist. So I'm listening to this and I'm going, there's no way that this can be that critical. The light environment, sun exposure. But the more I, I challenged uh, myself to learn this, I realized not only is it true, but I was actually a, a victim of this lifestyle. And, you know, my everything changed for me about five years ago when I started taking it seriously. And the circadian lifestyle has become just a daily thing. I don't even think about it anymore. And we can talk about some of the, the things that I do. And then the quantum side of it kind of fits right in. If, if, if you see my YouTube video, my goal in that was to tie light biology to circadian biology, to mitochondrial function. And, and there's a complete and direct link. And once you realize what Doug Wallace has been teaching, that most, if not, I would say the majority, maybe 90% of all chronic diseases that we see in our clinics every day are caused by mitochondrial dysfunction. And that's increasing over time uh, for, for reasons that he discusses called heter increasing mitochondrial heteroplasmy. So then the question is, okay, well, how do you fix that? How do you reverse it? And the answer is you can reverse it if you catch it soon enough. Now, obviously, if you wait until someone has cancer or Alzheimer's disease or, you know, those types of things, you're, you're left with traditional medicine. But I would think the person who's interested in preventive care with staying healthy, staying out of the doctor's office, you want to stay off my table. Uh, I mean, I, I do, I treat a lot of diabetics, but by the time they get to me, they have kidney failure and retinopathy and they're going blind. 
You don't want to be that patient. And so the best thing to do is to start early, take care of your mitochondria with the light environment and circadian biology and you know optimization. And that's, in my opinion, that's the best way in the modern environment to avoid those things. Yeah. And, and you mentioned you took a lot of supplements when you first started suspecting this is maybe mitochondrial. Did you think that those helped at all? Did anything? No. <laughs> Because I'll see people want a mega dose CoQ10 and L-carnitine and all these things. And I'm like, and I, still, I still will take those. I, I take, yeah. I think they have some benefit, but if, once your mitochondria are also, once your, your voltage gets low, your redox, as yes. we call it, we can explain what that means. Once yeah. your redox is already ruined, those supplements aren't going to do a damn thing. I, I'll be, it's just, uh, you're wasting your time. You got to actually recharge the batteries, so to speak. And the best way to do that is with sun exposure uh, and, and a few other things, but that's, that's where I would start. Yeah. Let's, let's, I didn't put that on the list, but let's talk a little bit about redox. Cause that's something I, I feel like people need to understand. And I say all the time, redox before you detox, right. <laughs> you don't yeah, want to be yeah. messing with those types of things, unless you really get your redox function up. Right. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, before we talk about redox, I think we, if people need to understand what a mitochondria is. And so the mitochondria you learn in, you know, whatever, eighth grade biology, it's the powerhouse of the cell, but it's so much more than that. It's, it's technically the battery powers of your cell. Your cell is actually uh, controlled, in my opinion, by the mitochondria. And so redox basically is the net negative charge. So the more negative your cell is due to mitochondrial function, the more battery power each cell has. And once your battery power gets drained and your net negative charge is less negative or more positive, then you lose the ability to control uh, free radical production, uh, abnormal gene uh, you know, you don't want to manifest certain genotypes. So you get, you inherit things from, you know, into your parents, your, your genotype. Well, you don't necessarily manifest those genes 100% of the time, unless the environmental stimulus that affects the mitochondria, which turns on and off certain gene patterns, uh, gets, uh, you know, that stimulus. So the mitochondria are critically important uh, for controlling your disease process. So redox is technically just when your mitochondria pump electrons into the cytoplasm of the cell, that's, that's really what they do. And so for, for years, decades even, we, we believe that the main source of energy for the cell was ATP. So it's, if you remember from your biology that, that electron chain transport on the inner mitochondrial membrane, you're pumping protons into uh, across the membrane, electrons out. And then over time, there's a gradient and it's cytochrome uh, five or six, there, there's basically an ATPase, which basically spins. The ATP is, is a good energy producer, but it's the electrons in the cytoplasm that create the battery charge. That's the redox. And so the, the less your mitochondria function, the less electrons it pumps out, the, the, your negative charge goes down in the cell and you lose battery power. That's how you get sick. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're basically losing charge. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, our cells are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and typically we're lacking those electrons. And so there's so many different ways that we can gather electrons into our bodies so that we can, like you said, improve redox. And that's right. really what I've been trying to educate people on. And food is electrons, right? But yeah, it's a redu they're all foods are reducing agents. So you're actually, right. you're right. Yeah. Right. But it, <laughs> In, as far as improving mitochondrial function, I think food is low on the list of what things that we really need to do in order to boost those electrons. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. as um, I, I guess as an ophthalmologist, how important is the eye and overall health? Because I think this is one of the most fascinating things I've, I've learned since jumping into this world. Yeah, we, we, we kind of have a joke in ophthalmology that, you know, you, you learn about the eye and you get to forget about everything else. Uh, but honestly, I mean, it's a joke, but really, to be honest with you, my view now of the eye is so much more profound than it was even as, uh, you know, a board certified ophthalmologist, I, because I view the eye as uh, probably the most important neurohormonal, neuropsychiatric uh, organ in the body. It, it literally controls metabolism. And people, when I say that, ophthalmologists look at me like I've got three heads. I mean, it's, it's amazing. But when you understand how the circadian cycle works and the fact that your eye has a direct link from the retina to the hypothalamus, 
Uh, there's a, as you know, the suprachiasmatic yep. nucleus, which is the master circadian clock. It's basically what runs your circadian rhythm, sends messages to every cell in the body. Okay. So when you receive information from the environment, light information, your retinal hypothalamic trap transmits that information to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That allows your cells to be on time with a circadian rhythm. And so you can completely derail that by staring at screens all day and never seeing the sun. Your, your physiology, and, and regardless of what people believe about you know, evolutionary biology, our system was, was evolved over millions of years, hundreds of thousands as humans. We, were, we evolved in the sunlight, okay? And so now we have replaced natural light with artificial light. And it's happened in a very, very short period of time, in, in, in a matter of a century. Well, now we are reprogramming our circadian rhythms to an alien sun, which doesn't vary diurnally. So if you, if you look at the spectrum of the sun from sunrise to sunset, it's the only thing that's stable in that process is infrared light. All the other wavelengths change because of the incident light angle that, uh, you know, with the, with the earth. So you have in the early morning, you have blue light and infrared, then you develop, you have UVA, then UVB and UVA. And then as the day weighs down, the blue increases and the UV decreases. Well, that diurnal spectrum is what your circadian clock was designed to see every single day. And so you can go a few days, you know, if you get up before the sun rises, you get home from work after it sets and you've looked at a screen all day, well, you are massively disrupting your circadian cycle. And so it's really pretty simple to reset your circadian rhythm. And so we can talk about some ways to do that. Incidentally, there's several articles that talk about taking a camping trip for four yes. or five days. I mean, one of the best ways to reset your circadian, leave your, your device at home, but that's a beautiful way to do it. And then, you know, from there, you can make changes in your daily life to make sure you stay. And we, we all have to have late dinners and, you know, we, we all have those things socially, but there's ways to do it 90% of the time. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's people get kind of like, oh, I can't go outside. I have a job. I have this, I have that. And, but sure, <laughs> I, I have at the end of this, like, how do you live a quantum lifestyle with four teenagers and being an eye surgeon? You've fi obviously figured out a way to do this because you've reversed your health. So it's very possible, right? It, it has to be intentional. And, and someone, yes. has, I think, you know, people are, you know, I see patients all day, every day. And one of the things that if a patient or a person doesn't believe something, and they don't have conviction, they're very, very unlikely to change their behavior. And so what I find is patient education, and, and oftentimes just using very, very simple examples, kind of helps them. But, and I think it's exactly the same way with the light story. And obviously, when you have a pretty dramatic change in health, most people want to listen. I mean, if you, when you get sick, and traditional medicine has no answers other than to prescribe more medications, and you have to take medicines to prevent side effects from the other medicines, it's a problem. And it's a cycle that can be broken, but you have to be intentional about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I guess what, what I really would love to talk about is, you know, this whole go jump back a little bit to the metabolism thing. Cause yeah. I know a lot of my listeners are going to latch on to like, okay, well, he was still insulin resistant, yeah. even though he was following this perfect diet, like yeah. how on earth does okay, the so, eye... Yeah. Well, understand that because the master circadian clock, the su suprachiasmatic nucleus, yes. it actually has your GI system, the pancreas included, uh, receives vagal nerve stimulation, which is in the, you know, from the hypothalamus. So there's a direct link, not only to the pituitary gland, which, which is the, the master hormone pharmacy of the brain, uh, so which, can, and you know, your thyroid hormones, pituitary, I mean, they're all involved in metabolism as, as well as ACTH. But the vagal nerve sends parasympathetic information to your GI system and particularly to the pancreas. So when you are stimulated by high energy blue or, or artificial light all day, every day, uh, you will send messages that are out of time, out of sync with your, your consumption of food. So you're going to over, you can become insulin resistant just by being blue light toxic. 
Okay, and, and I have multiple studies uh, in mammals that prove that, and I'm a sitting example of someone where that was the case. There's no other, there's no other explanation uh, in my particular case. But so you, you actually can overproduce insulin. You become insulin resistant without having a high carb diet. Okay, and this is this is something that makes most doctors kind of you know scratch their head. But most it's people, <laughs> it's absolutely true. And, you know, so metabolism is, and there's a book called Metabolism that is influenced by ocular, your, your ocular health. And uh, so Dr. Fritz Hallwich, and I have a book, it was written in the 70s. So this guy, what he was doing, this is very interesting. And it's probably one of the things that influenced me to, to really go down this rabbit hole. He was operating in a time when they didn't put intraocular lens implants in. So he removes these really mature cataracts from people that are technically blind. And he allowed them to have natural sunlight. And what he, he measured metabolites uh, before and after surgery. And what he was finding was he was correcting their metabolism. Their metabolism changed dramatically just by having natural sunlight on, the, in their, on their retina. Because what he was basically doing is resetting their circadian rhythm, getting natural light to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So then the master clock controls every cell in the body. Uh, and so they were, they were able to correct some metabolic abnormalities that otherwise they really had no idea why they had. And, and I think that was, it is amazing. And it'd be interesting study to do now, only we don't do cataract surgery. We, we put implants in that block UV light and probably yeah. much of the infrared, which, you know, it's a frustrating part of my profession, but something I've tried to, I've, I've tried to push back on and I'm trying to get people to understand and give me some better circadian implants that I can use. Yeah, that was one of my questions is how you kind of get around some of these things now as a as a quantum eye surgeon. Yeah, I, I've kind of got um, one foot in the uh, quantum kind of alternative side and one foot in the traditional side. And, you know, I try to balance it just because I, I need to make a living. But at the same time, it gives me an opportunity in the traditional clinic to not only educate the patients in a different way, but also the doctors. Too. I've got three or four guys that you know are close to me. They were absolute skeptics from day one. And now they're starting to have these conversations. So just, you know, it's a grassroots effort. Definitely is. And, you know, what percentage of people, I guess, in general, would you say are blue light toxic? Would you think it's most people at this point? It depends on the age, but, yeah. but I think the majority of people uh, probably under the age of 50, um, yeah. I'd say most teenagers are already there. And, and, you know, I have three teenagers in my house and it, the majority of their friends take medication for sleep, anxiety, wow. depression, ADHD, uh, the uh, incidence of autism in yep. young people is through the roof. I mean, yep. there was just a study from Japan, recent, I think in the last week, that showed a high correlation between screen use and autism uh, in kids. So I think I think we're getting there. I think the message is getting out, but we're we're kind of battling, you know, kind of some old guard. And sometimes science, in order for us to change the mindset in science, sometimes the old scientists have to, to have pass away. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> what, <laughs> what usually happens. So yeah, anyway. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I have a 14 year old with uh, non-speaking autism. And one of the first things I did when I started learning about circadian biology and quantum physics was take her iPad away, which was not fun yeah. because that's was her entertainment, but we've had to really relearn home life and relearn how to be without a screen. And it's actually been really awesome for the family where we read together we're reading the Temple Grandin book right now. And it just, it brings our family closer. But for so many years, I'm like, God oh, dang, I let her just be on that thing. Yeah, and you didn't, you didn't know. I mean, I nobody's no talking idea. about it. Yeah, yeah that's... no one's talking about it. But her behavior got so much better once I got that device and all those non-native EMFs it, away from her. It was like night and day. Well, it's interesting you, you say that. Um, there's a book by John Ott called Health and Light. Mm -hmm. that yes. you're, if you read that, mm -hmm. the study that he does in there with um, the fluorescent lights in yes. the classroom and, and basically does time-lapse photography watching the kids and their, their behavior is so much worse mm -hmm. under fluorescent lights to the point that many of them were being diagnosed with ADHD. But as soon as they put them under a full spectrum light or even just open the windows and let natural light in, over time, their behavior calmed down because there's no question high energy blue light um, is stimulatory. Okay, that, that's why, you know, when you, 
you get up in the morning, you go outside and you look at the sun, you, there's a lot of blue light. It wakes you up. I mean, you can actually get pretty aroused by blue light. Uh, that's why you don't want to look at your screen right before you go to bed. But it also increases cortisol production. And so all of that can lead not only to physiologic changes, but mental and behavioral changes as well. Absolutely. Um, I'd love to talk about your like perfect quantum day, like how you go through your day, how you navigate things and, and add all these practices in. Yeah, it, it really kind of depends on the day. So my OR days are a little bit more challenging because I, I start operating at 7 a.m. So there's a lot of, you know, not a lot of sunrise before that. Uh, I, but typically what I would do is I, I like to get up in the morning uh, with the sunrise, okay? And so, but before I ever see the sunrise, the first thing I do, I have a pair of blue blockers that sit by my bed. And it's just naturally, these are my nighttime blue blockers. They go on. At, so, because I, I, what I want to do, the first light of the day, I want to be the sunset, the sunrise. And so I, I walk outside, take the glasses off, walk around a little bit, grounding if it's not, you know, 10 degrees. But, um, and so you get that for 15, 20 minutes, drink, a, you know, if I have a cup of coffee, if I want it. But then th the next thing is, usually about, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour after I'm awakened and I've seen the sunrise, then I, then I have my first meal of the day. And so I practice uh, early time restricted feed, feeding most days. Um, and I usually like to eat within an hour after uh, I'm awake uh, and typically have been exposed to the uh, sunrise. Um, next, during my day, it, it depends. If I'm in the OR, I, I'll, I'll take breaks and I'll just go outside, uh, take my glasses off and just kind of, particularly in the OR, because I'm getting a lot of, you know, really, artificial yeah. light. But uh, it's really good to do that probably five minute breaks throughout the day. So, uh, in the clinic, it's much easier for me to do. And oftentimes I'll sit, I, my desk is by a window, just open the window. Uh, if it's not freezing out, the staff didn't fuss at me too bad. So uh, I can get some natural light just through an open window. Um, then I'll lunch break, I'll go out, you know, if I'm, if I'm eating lunch that day, I'll, I'll go ahead and eat outside uh, as much as I can. Sun, sunlight and eating go well together. Uh, so, and, and there's, a, there's actually science behind that as well. Typically, I'm done eating before sunset. Um, if I eat a third meal a day, it's going to be usually around four or five o'clock. Uh, I, I do try to get a workout in about the time I get home. Uh, and then when the sun goes down, my blue nighttime blue blockers are on. Those are the ones that block even into the green spectrum. Um, it's, it's really important to me. Uh, it, I try to get my family involved with that and er, everybody's kind of, you know, keeping each other accountable. But, you know, we, we talk about the electro, electromagnetic fields in the home and, and that's a deeper rabbit hole. I don't know if you want to go into that. I'd love to talk about it a little. I think it's really important when you get to, when it's time for bed, I think you really want to pay attention to your sleep cave. And I call it a sleep cave because that's really what we need. Um, you need a really dark environment. It needs to be cool. Uh, you need to have as little or no EMF in your bedroom or around your bedroom as possible. And there's some science behind why that. But, you know, so you want to, we live in a modern world. So we, we do have internet in my home. Uh, we typically use wired ethernet. Uh, but we, we have a, a Wi-Fi system. It's only on when somebody needs it and then it goes back off. And then at night, it absolutely has to go off. off. Yeah. yeah. No, no Wi-Fi in the home. Because sleep, I think, is, is a critical period for neuron recovery, autophagy, mitophagy. And so you don't want to disrupt that any more than you have to. Uh, but, you know, most people sleep with their phone beside their bed. I think that's the worst thing you yeah. can do. Um, <laughs> It needs to be, I, I just either put it on airplane mode or put it in the other room. Uh, the only time mine's even, I can even hear it is when I'm on call, but it's usually, you know, 20 feet away from me. Uh, and, and I think that's important. So I want to sleep about eight hours, seven and a half, eight hours. Um, and typically I don't even use an alarm clock at all. Um, unless I'm, I'm traveling and I got to get up at four or five in the morning, but typically it's just natural. The, the circadian rhythm, once it's reset, it's going to be uh, pretty predictable. Yeah. So that's kind of the, my, that's my circadian day. Uh, I mean, weekends are a little different. You know, I spend more time outside in the morning than, than I'm able to on my work days. Um, in the fall and spring, I coach uh, sports. So I'm outside pretty much from the time. I try to 
get finished with my work day about 3.30. So I, I try to spend as much time in the afternoon and evening. Sunsets are, are, are amazing. Uh, I, I would tell people to watch as many sunrises and sunsets as you can. That is good for your, it's good for your mental health. It's also good for your physiology. I agree. I mean, that's one of the things my husband remarked on since I've been doing sunrise every day. He's like, you actually got smarter. I don't know. <laughs> He's like, I don't know how that's possible, but you're sharper. You're smarter. Like it's, you're just different. I'm like, it's the sun. I mean, it's literally the UVA rays coming in my eyes, helping my brain make all those I, neurotransmitters. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I mean, we can talk about dopamine, which, you know, the, the stimulus to produce dopamine starts in the eye. Yes. Um, and so, you know, when you talk about people being blue light toxic and you deplete dopamine, so there's a lot of things that deplete dopamine, okay? And, but, but blue light is a really important one. And it's one of the dark sides of, of artificial light. And I'll tell you that when I was blue light toxic, you know, I, you get to the point in, in certain professions where you can almost do it in your sleep. You can kind of sleepwalk through the day. And so for me, the practice of medicine and what I've been doing for 22 years, I didn't really have to challenge myself mentally every day. But when I was blue light toxic, you know, I would, I would struggle. By the end of the day, my brain was, I was done. I mean, I, I really was just want to go home and sleep. Since I've been practicing a circadian lifestyle, I, I think my IQ has gone up 10 or 15 points. My, my wife will tell you, you, your brain never turns off, and you know, which is a curse sometimes. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I feel like I'm 25 again mentally, which was really frustrating because, man, I'm getting neuro, neurogenic disease. And I think, yeah. to be honest with you, with vestibular cochlear neuritis, my opinion is the next stops on the train for me were probably going to be Alzheimer's or Parkinson's yeah. and that's a reality that not many people want to think about and if you can direct course by just you know altering your lifestyle why in the world would you not absolutely that's why I'm so passionate about sharing this with people because so many people you know they get to my age I'm 42 and I was already starting to feel brain fog and just like oh, just yeah. not clear just not myself and then it's like I make these lifestyle changes the blue blockers windows open sunrise sunset and just of course, changing all the bulbs in the house and driving my husband insane. Um, now I have uh, this guy. I just got this yesterday. Um, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> the EMF meter. I'm taking yeah. a um, a quantum course, and they were like, "That's the one you want to get." Yeah. And I'm like, "All right, great." So my husband's like, "Great, now you're a Ghostbuster." Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You no, know, I when I first got down this road, I had, had I used a cornet, but I was walking. I was everywhere I went. I was taking it with me. I tell you, the airports are, are scary. Oh God! <laughs> you, know, you don't want to turn one on at the no. airport, but um, you know, you, you just want to kind of know, particularly the time, places you spend the most time in. Yes. You want to know that you're protected there. You need to have some safe space because you don't know what's going on in you know in your workplace, right? You know, in, you know the the public places. You can't control that. Mm -mm. The good thing for us, I live uh, in a more rural area of 60 acres intentionally wow uh, so we have a fairly quiet you know environment here as far as uh, wi-fi emf there's just not a lot of 5g or anything out here so we we ha I had an engineer bioengineer come out and test it for us um so we we had to make some changes in the wire and then the house i do turn off my uh the the wire the electrical in my bedroom at night mm -hmm. um i sleep on a magnetico yes. uh, if you've seen those um, yes you know, just some little things. I mean, I think the most important thing, though, is just if we can get people outside more in the natural sunlight off their screens, we're going to that that's that's the probably the most important yeah. thing. And then you start adding layers to this. And once you've gotten it down, it just becomes kind of second nature to you. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just little things that you do. I mean, I've been gradually making changes. First, it was let's change all the bulbs to incandescent and then let's add some red bulbs in and then let's get a kill switch for the Wi-Fi and, you know, have everyone be vigilant about using that. And there's just little things that you change out, change out the different water. And I mean, we're still in Atlanta with tons of neighbors. The goal is to get out. We are looking at some houses, but, you know, for now, my health has been able to completely turn around still living in the city when I know when I turn this guy on, I'm going to be like, ah, <laughs> but yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it is, um, you know, it's all, all, all relative. I mean, you're, you've made a huge improvement. It's kind of like, you know, you've been in nutrition for a while. You take people yep. who've been on the standard American diet. 
whatever they do, if they stop eating processed food, sugar, seed oils, I mean, that right there is, is a yes. huge part of it. And then however else you want to break it down, whether you want to do the carnivore, keto, low carb, paleo, you've already beat 90% of the population just by you know, changing those three things. Yeah. So, but, and what you're doing right now, and, and there's, there's definitely other things you can do from a mitochondrial standpoint. Like I do some pretty crazy things uh, or I, I did more of it when I was sick and I do it now on a maintenance standpoint. But yeah. I mean, full thermogenesis is one that I, I love. I do it all the oh, time, yeah. especially in the wintertime. Uh, I'll do it three or four times a week. In the summer, probably once a week, maybe every other week. More sunshine in the summer, cold in the winter. So it uh, yeah. it's amazing. I love it. I agree. I think my neighbors are, they think I'm completely insane because they'll see me out on the deck in a bikini jumping into <laughs> ice water. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They're like, what the, at first she's in her pajamas in the front yard barefoot, and then she'll go in the backyard into the cold plunge in like 30 yeah, degree that's, weather. <laughs> that's the advantage of living in a rural area. I, I'm on a dead end road and nobody ever comes to my house anyway. So uh, yeah, unless they're invited. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like it starts good conversations. You know, there's there's oh, that sure. advantage, but I'm just to the point now where I'm like, I don't care. I know it's 30 degrees and I'm in a bikini outside, but you know, I'm healthier than I've ever been. So it's think, something must be working. <laughs> yeah, I think cold therapy is probably for, for the right mitochondrial haplotype. Okay, yeah, so I'm, I'm an H2. I, yeah, I have some Asian friends and some African American friends who have we've talked to about it, and they want to do it. And what I tell them is, listen, get your circadian rhythm dialed in mm -hmm. first. Okay, that needs to be first because the last thing you want to do is have uh, an abnormal circadian rhythm, mitochondrial dysfunction, and, and jump in a pool and stay too long because you're actually probably going to harm yourself more. So there's steps to do it, um, yeah. and also certain haplotypes do better. Like I, I mean. I'm a Viking. I mean, I, there's no question. We, we have ne Neanderthal DNA. So cold is literally ancestral for me. Um, yeah. Or some people probably need a little less, you know, 60 degree water, maybe 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, where I can do 35 degree water for an hour. Yep. And, oh, gosh. You know, yeah. It's just, <laughs> but I, I don't do that often, but I can. I think 30 minutes at about 40 degrees is probably all you need. Oh, yeah, I, I love it. And I'm trying to get more and more women to do it. I've had a lot of cold plunge experts on the show lately, because I just feel like that's, you know, the light has been number one, but cold thermogenesis has been a life changer for me this year. And I just want to keep encouraging people to do it. Well, yeah, if you look at all of the benefits, you know, from weight loss, mm -hmm. to mitochondrial health, to neurologic health, I mean, it's it's pretty profound. And, and I don't is. think there's, there's, it's just uncomfortable when you begin. And yeah, once, once you get into it, you know, the first 30 seconds, you kind of breathe, you breathe through it and then you actually enjoy it. It's like, it's good. Yeah. I've actually had some of my most productive times after cold thermogenesis. Just like, you know, yeah. I'm, it's really like your brain just gets recharged immediately. So it does. It I would does. encourage people to give it a try. Just do it safely, gradually, cold adapt for a while. Um, some people think cold showers are the way to start. To be honest with you, I can get in a, a 35 degree pool, but I hate a cold shower. Hey, me too. It's, just it's worse. Day. Yeah, the water's <laughs> moving. I, it's just, you got to move not, around and yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> I'm the same way. I had gotten in the sauna and then decided I was going to do a quick cold shower a few weeks yeah. ago. And my husband was in the bedroom and he heard me in the bathroom. I was like, oh God, <laughs> he's like, what's, are you okay in there? I'm like, I'm trying to take a cold shower. This just is way worse than the plunge. Like I'd rather just jump in the plunge, you know? And I, yeah. and I think to do true cold, like I do, when I did martial arts for years, we used to do cold baths afterwards to recover. We're only staying in three or four minutes, five minutes just for recovery. For true cold thermogenesis, I think you need to get to the point where you have a almost like a hard chill, like you're, you get that uh, shivering thermogenesis. That's when I get out. And so I basically, people ask me, well, how long do you stay in? Well, it kind of depends on how cold the water is. Because if it's yeah. 50, it might take me an hour to get there. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. you know, so I get to that hard uh, uh, chill where I'm shivering and then I'm good. And then I let, I kind of warm up naturally. You mentioned sauna. Um, what type of sauna do you guys use? Uh, right now I just have a sauna blanket. I am trying yeah. to get a clear light. That's the one I really want. Cause I've heard it's the lowest EMF, but right now I just have the blanket. Yeah. We, I have a clear light. I've had it for yeah. about four years. Um, you know, I, 
I love sorrow. I think it's amazing. I, I actually have kind of upfit mine with some extra infrared oh, and nice. also I have UV lights in there as well. So I can turn the, the UV on for a while. Um, it's UVA, UVB. You have it's a spurty? It's, it's spurty. Yeah, it's a yep. spurty. It's the sun lamp because I, I okay. really wanted more of a full spectrum. So, you know, I, I firmly believe that we were designed to be exposed to UV, yes. but never in isolation. Yeah. So most of the studies that show that UV is, quote, dangerous for you were done with and UV is. in isolation. Yeah. And so you never experience UV in the natural environment without infrared ever. Right. And yeah. so UV is very stimulatory. It's also it creates oxidation, whereas infrared actually is the neutralizing factor uh, for that. So it actually reduces oxidation and free radicals. So you actually need to do it together, in, in my opinion. And so if, you, if people use a spurty for their vitamin D, if they're using the spurty vitamin D lamp, I recommend either doing it, if you're going to do it, do it either with a inf good infrared light or just do it outside because the sun, yes. the rest of the spectrum of the sun is going to balance that UV to make vitamin D. Yeah, I agree. And if I'm using my Sparity, I have my EMR tech going on my legs behind me and I flip and do that. Yeah. So I always have a red light and I tell people like, if you're going to do that, you would darn better get up and see sunrise and UVA and precondition your skin before you get in front of the Sparity. Like, yeah, I think that's absolutely. really important too to have that hormonal rise. Yeah. I, I'm a big believer in infrared. Uh, I, you know, Michael Hamlin's got a textbook on the, uh, it talks about the neurology of uh, infrared light. I mean, it's a probably a thousand page textbook. I read the whole thing. It had nothing to do with ophthalmology, but I was just fascinated. They go through a lot of the mechanisms and particularly the cytochrome C oxidase, which is a, mm -hmm. has a pretty profound photopigment that absorbs infrared light. But, you know, once you start realizing that not only, I mean, infrared has, has many benefits for skin, weight, you know, fat loss, things like that. But I'm really interested in it from a mitochondrial optimization yes. standpoint. Yeah. So I, I don't do a lot of targeted therapy. I mean, I know people do it for injuries and stuff like that. My main goal is just mitochondrial optimization. Yeah, I absolutely love red light therapy. And it's kind of my new <laughs> rabbit hole. I've been going down. Chris uh, from EMR Tech has become a good friend of mine. And yeah, um, Great yeah, yeah Great. I love theirs. And uh, so I, I always encourage people to, if they're trying to improve mitochondrial health, to look into that. And like you said, we have red light, it's all day. So you can get yeah. some free red light therapy by outside with no, as little clothes on as possible. <laughs> yeah, I get, I get questions on Twitter about this all the time. It's like, you know, well, it's, it's kind of cold outside. Uh, should I get, listen, the sun is, is good for you year round. You yes. may not be able to make vitamin D, but the infrared's there all the time. And the circadian messaging is yes. there every day, no matter where you are, unless you're in Alaska during the dark season, right? Yeah. Um, so get the sun, get outside. It doesn't matter, you know, whether you can make vitamin D or not. The yeah. sun's not just about vitamin D. No. Yeah. I mean, I'm here in Atlanta, so we get D pretty much year round, but it's the UV index is not strong enough for it to really do probably a whole lot. I'm in, I'm in Greenville, near Greenville. Okay. Uh, yeah. probably a, it's probably about three, but it's only about three or four hours in the middle of the day, which most yeah. people have a hard time getting there. Yeah, so. exactly. Exactly. I would love to hear about how food is tied to the SCN. And uh, I have such a hard time convincing people, especially women, that they've been in this kind of intermittent fasting community for so long. They think that they should delay their eating until later in the day. And, you know, a big game changer for me is like you said, in your quantum routine that you eat breakfast within an hour of sunrise there's some science behind that as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. no question. There's definitely, and in fact, a, a good, a good book on that. If people are interested. I, Dr. Sachin Panda has a book called The Circadian Code. Now he, he's not as versed in light biology uh, as I would like for him to be, but, but he definitely has the feeding schedule, right? Uh, and so, so the way I tell people to think about it is when you wake up in the morning, you, you basically have fasted for however long you were sleeping your metabolism gets turned on, whether you want it to or not, by blue light in the sun or on your screens, okay? That's where, when all the messaging for production of um, all of the metabolites starts in the morning. And then UVA hits our eyes and our pituitary gland starts making cortisol and, and many of the other hormones. So they're all diurnal. You need to fuel 
when your metabolism gets revved up, okay? It, it, there's a circadian uh, process to your GI system as well. You can control your circadian rhythm through feeding too. And so basically every cell, every system has kind of an independent circadian cycle that if something happens to your uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus, they can still run on a circadian timing. But with food can actually influence your circadian rhythm. So if you're eating later in the day, late at night, your metabolism is designed to slow down before you go to sleep. And then, so if you're trying to process food and metabolize food as you're going to bed, it's a real big problem because what that does is it increases free radicals. It doesn't allow your, your body to perform autophagy, uh, which is a really critical cycle that's designed to be done while you're fasting during sleep. The, so what I typically do is tell people, if you're going to eat dinner, you really want to eat two, at least two or three hours before bedtime, okay? Preferably, I'm going to eat before the sun sets. Um, because that gives me plenty of time and I can start shutting down my processes with my artificial uh, blocking light blocking glasses um, to prepare for bed. So that, but Sachin Panda's book, uh, The Circadian Code really had some good, there's definitely some research on uh, circadian feeding. Uh, early time restricted feeding is, is kind of what I typically do. And you can do, eat one meal a day, just eat breakfast. If you really need to lose some weight, eat the next day or what like I do typically two meals a day I'll eat the first meal uh, an hour after rising and then at some point in the early to late afternoon I'll eat my second meal and that's it um, but it, it works out great you can um, you know tailor your caloric needs to what your activity level is but and then as far as like how I feed like what type of macros I typically do keto during the winter okay uh, the rationale for that is that if you think ancestrally, most latitudes in the world, uh, there are very few carbohydrates available during the wintertime, naturally, okay? And so the sunlight, your latitude, has an absolute impact on how you process carbohydrates. If you live in a very, very high UV index environment, you're going to be able to process carbohydrates, fruits, you know, vegetables much more effectively than in a, in a cold, dark environment. They just don't grow there. So our, we actually have received the same information from the sun that the plants do. And so if we got a low UV index uh, environment and you're eating high carbs, you're not going to process those well at all. And you're going to create a lot of inflammation. So I do keto during the winter. Um, and then during the summer, I will add in some seasonal vegetables and some fruit. Um, you know, I, I still keep it in the low carb range, but, you know, I know your carnivore people, uh, you know, probably, and I think carnivore is a great approach for a lot of people, um, got, have no price, way better than a lot of other diet. I just choose to do a more seasonal approach. I like fruits and vegetables anyway. I think they have some nutritional benefits as long as you don't overdo it with the fruit. I agree. And last summer I experimented for the first time in like three years with adding in some of those foods that were seasonal and local that had carbohydrate in them. And my body actually did great with them. I was expecting, you know, Oh, this is terrible. I'm doing carbs, but UV light depletes glycogen. You know, this is a perfect Absolutely. time of year for us to have those foods. And if they're seasonal, local, local, then I think they can be really good for us. I don't think we should be afraid or demonize those foods, but like you said, keto is a lot more ancestrally appropriate in the winter time because we just don't have those things growing it just is is not there yeah. and, and if you do if you do have them you probably got them from a subtropical latitude <laughs> so. absolutely yep <laughs> um you know one thing i wanted to ask you about was protecting the eyes because i did a post on instagram probably six months ago where i said i haven't worn sunglasses in three years and you know, of course I got a ton of pushback from people who were like, oh, you're, you're ruining your eyes by not wearing sunglasses. And, um, is there ever an instance where someone would need to protect their eyes with sunglasses? Yeah, I, mean, I think when I get pushback, even from ophthalmologists and optometrists on that, I yeah. ask them what percentage of the time do your patients spend outside? Like on an <laughs> average week, 10%. Okay. So what exactly do you need to protect them? Uh, do you think they're being overexposed to the sun or are they being overexposed to artificial light? Wh which has a more prominent impact in the modern society? 
Um, are there times when I do wear sun protection? Yes. If I'm going to be fishing on the water all day, if I'm, a, if I'm snow skiing in reflected light, I think there's some event. Now, I'm still going to take them off periodically and absorb some natural light. But, you know, I don't necessarily want 10 hours of sun on my eyes. It's no different than the skin. OK, because, yeah. you know, I, I actually have developed pretty decent UV callus, but I'm still not going to stay, you know, a UV index of 12 for eight hours. I, my skin won't tolerate that. I'm, I'm Scotch Irish. But yeah, I can, <laughs> but, but so what I do is I don't use sunscreen either. I get the sun that I need and then I cover up or I get out of the sun. I will use yeah. non nano zinc, you know, which is the what they use for babies. I'll put it on my nose because I do get a little crispy there. But um, yeah. it, it's to me, it's no different than sun exposure on the skin and the eyes. Do I think it's okay in certain environments where you're going to be outside all day to wear some sunglasses? Yes, but still, you're going to take them off. Uh, I, I wouldn't wear them 100 percent of the time. But yeah. certain environments, I do wear contact lenses for certain activities. Um, I, when I do train martial arts, when I do water sports, and when I snow ski, um, it's because it's terrible wearing goggles with, with glasses. So um, oh, you can get prescription goggles, but you know, I don't ski that much. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. That That's really helpful. And what are your views on LASIK surgery? I've heard so many different conflicting views on people yeah. getting LASIK. Uh, you know, I, I was a LASIK surgeon for about, let's see, when did I, probably about 15 years. And, you know, I will say that theoretically, disrupting the neuropsin in your cornea, which is in the corneal stroma, the keratocytes, potentially, in my, I think that for somebody who's kind of on the edge, could that throw off their circadian rhythm? Maybe. Yeah, I think theoretically, yes. I think it also depends on how much stroma of the cornea that's being removed with the eczema laser. So does everybody affect it the same way? Probably not. And I think it's going to affect some people more than others. Unfortunately, we have no way to test for neuropsin in the cornea. So I don't have any sound clinical studies to say LASIK can cause circadian disruption. Okay, I can tell you that, though, if someone has LASIK or cataract surgery because you're putting in a UV blocking implant, I'm going to suggest to them that they need to be outside even more. OK, in the sun, because I do think that there's some redundancies in the system. UVA is in the cornea. It's also in the retina. There's probably some evidence it's in the sclera. It's in the skin. So we have redundancies in the system. The problem is if you have LASIK cataract surgery and you wear sunglasses all the time and you wear sunscreen completely, you've put a tarp over every photoreceptor you have. And that's a problem because that's more likely where people are going to get in trouble. Uh, if they just have LASIK, you know, I think it depends. I think they, if they tailor their light environment in a certain way, I don't think it's probably going to be that influential. Now, if you tell me somebody has multiple mitochondrial issues and they do LASIK, could that tip them over? I think it's conceivable, yes. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so if I, you know, I probably hedged a little bit simply because I don't have really good scientific data proving that. I think there's a suspicion that particularly in some settings, some patients, that it could be an issue. I just don't like to say yes or no when I don't have clear evidence that that's the case. Does that make sense? Well, absolutely. I really respect that. Absolutely. Um, what are your views on vitamin D supplementation? Um, it depends. Um, short term, somebody that's severely low, lives in envir a low UV environment, I have no problem with it. I think it's better than not, not having vitamin D. Um, I think long-term people need to figure out how to make it from, from light, from sunlight particularly. Uh, if you live in a Northern latitude, it's gonna be a little difficult, uh, especially this time of year. Um, if it's appropriate for the person, their skin type, if their doctor doesn't have a problem with it. See, I view light therapy as, as medicine, okay? So it's, I don't like putting out just blanket recommendations. Everybody should go get a spurty D line. I, I, I don't think that's appropriate. Because there's certain, there's certain skin conditions and uh, that that are you know contraindicated. But I think if it's appropriate for the person, you know, a spurty lamp could be very helpful. If and I would recommend using it with infrared light or outside. But I think it's okay in a short-term situation. The problem with supplementing vitamin D year-round, especially, is that vitamin D is not just a vitamin. It is a hormone. 
Okay, so steroid hormone that has multiple different uh, functions. Okay, and so when you do take a supplement, it's the end product. You actually have negative feedback loop, loops on enzymes and byproducts further upstream that are going to reduce the person's ability to actually make vitamin D. And you're missing a lot of the byproducts that are that are bioactive from you know because vitamin D is made from LDL cholesterol on the skin from sun exposure. There's a lot of products between that LDL cholesterol and 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3 that's finalized in the kidney. If you're missing every one of those steps in between because you took the end product, yes, you can raise your vitamin D serum level, but you really skipped a lot of steps. And there's very few things in physiology where you should you can shortcut and get the same result. Yep, I agree. So, I agree. It, so do I think supplementation is appropriate for some people? Yes but not long-term and certainly not year-round when you've got free vitamin D all day in the, in the summer months. What do you think good blood levels of vitamin D are? What people should I like to see for? greater than 60. Yeah. 60 or greater. I mean, you know, we, we can talk for hours about vitamin D and COVID. You know, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in Mexico the first week of March, 2020 for a week. Uh, and we, we go down, we try to go to Mexico once, at least once a year. And everybody's like freaking out. How are you going to get back? You're going to get stressed. So look, I'm in the perfect place. I'm making vitamin D right now. And I, I have uh, emails and text messages to my colleagues and I'm sitting here telling them, I will guarantee you that in the years to come, there's going to be a, a strong correlation between the person's serum vitamin D levels and the severity of COVID that they get. Mm -hmm. I mean, I literally said, this is going to happen. And they were like, yeah, whatever. All right. So, but I've been talking about it ever since. And certainly it, it's, it's a huge factor. And it's not just the vitamin D level. A lot of it is the sun exposure that people get. I do think vitamin D has been important for T cells, but you know, that's another discussion. Yeah. When we got it, we, it was August here in Atlanta. And so we just were out in the sun. I mean, <laughs> as much as we could be, Absolutely. that was my medicine as I just was basically sunbathing, drinking electrolytes and resting. And, uh, we all recovered pretty quickly, but yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. I, I had it, never knew I had it. Um, oh, wow. Never, yeah. I totally asymptomatic. My wife had a little bit of decreased smell and taste, but we didn't know that was COVID then. Cause it was like April of 2020. We just then uh, nobody was talking about taste and smell. We both got, we gave blood and had antibodies checked. And it's like, wait a minute, we've had COVID. Okay, wow. great. <laughs> well, that was nothing. But, you know, so I think that, that would, I, I would have been able to predict with vitamin D levels, mitochondria health, you're not going to have a problem with COVID. Yeah. But, you know, obviously if we can get more of the population on this path and we should have been talking, I mean, the public health experts should have been talking about all this, these things that we're talking about two years ago. Um, unfortunately, that's not the direction of healthcare. Oh, it's not. It's not. It's it's sick care, unfortunately. Um, I guess another topic with, with COVID would be melatonin also, because yeah. that's our hormone of repair. Um, what do you think about supplementing melatonin? Not a, not a fan. Um, again, it's one of those there's substances that you are designed to make naturally from sun exposure. Mm -hmm. Melatonin is one of those. And it's also- Make that through your eye, right? Yeah. The stimulus to make melatonin and the first place that it's made is in the eye from UVA in the sun in the morning. Okay. So your melatonin is a neurohormone. It has massive effects. And one of the probably the most important effects that it has besides, you know, circadian regulation is mitochondrial stabilization. It stabilizes the mitochondrial membrane. It's also responsible for controlling the processes of mitophagy and mitogenesis, which is basically getting rid of bad mitochondria, making new mitochondria. So one of the things that they found in COVID was that, you know, melatonin is, is pretty important and the reason is because COVID attacks or disrupts mitochondrial function. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that get long COVID, similar to Epstein-Barr virus, you know, the people that get chronic fatigue, it's probably a hangover from the mitochondria disruption. Uh, that, I think that's going to be, be borne out in the literature. But melatonin is critically important for mitochondrial uh, function. It's designed to be made from sunlight. If you take it by a pill, you're probably going to decrease your ability to naturally produce it. And any, my opinion is anything that you can make naturally, you should, unless you can't. And so if you have your pituitary removed, 
go ahead and take the pituitary hormones. But otherwise, you need to be doing things to optimize that. That's another thing I had. I had very low testosterone at 35. Um, had had some thyroid abnormalities. Uh, growth hormone was suppressed. I had pan, not hypopituitarism, but definitely a deficiency of pituitary hormones. Most of my physicians thought it was due to uh, some head trauma, just concussions, uh, playing sports as a as a kid. But I've reversed that completely with my light environment. Amazing. Yeah. And when I turned 35, I remember going to the doctor because I just didn't feel good and tested all my hormones and my testosterone was very low. And it's just been that way for years. But when I added in uh, sun, when I added in red light therapy, when I added in cold therapy, now my doctor's like, how the hell did you do that with your testosterone? It's been low for years. And now it's like at a really good level. I'm like, just nature. Yeah, my, my primary <laughs> care doctor is a, he's a good guy. He kind of, he kind of listens to me, uh, my nonsense, <laughs> if you will. Uh, but he, he was puzzled, but, but to be honest with you, he's actually come along. He's kind of gotten into this, uh, this whole mindset and paradigm as well. I mean, I think probably because he's watched what happened to me. Yeah. That's, the, that's the best thing we can do is live by example. Cause if I try to talk to my family about this stuff, they're just like, I can't, I, I just, it's too much. Cause I'm the crazy one. I've been vegan. I've been carnivore. I've done it all. And so now I come out with my EMF meter and they're like, just please just stop. <laughs> you know. Okay. But when they see that I've made a dramatic health transformation, then they want to understand like why I'm wearing the blue blockers, like what's going on. So I think that's the best thing we can do. One of the, one of the things I did with my kids and my wife, when we first started doing this, you know, you take your EMF meter, and you turn the microwave on and you sit, you, you put it close to it and you show them what's happening. And then you say, okay, uh, are you going to turn that microwave on and go put your head against the microwave? And they're like, heck no. Why would I do right. that? That's crazy. And I said, bring me your phone. And I show them it's exactly the same amount of EMF coming out of their phone. So you now you're going to put that cell phone. So you're putting a microwave against your head. Yep. And they're like, wow, okay. That's, that's a visual that they won't forget. So my, my family, nobody get, puts a, puts a cell phone to their head for very long. <laughs> that's so good. Yeah. I did a reel on Instagram showing my uh, EMF meter next to the microwave and then the EMF meter next to AirPods. Cause I yeah. used to chronically oh, yeah. wear AirPods and it was like the same thing. I'm like, yep. Yeah, it's, do you really want to stick your head in a microwave? Like do not use those things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, DHA and the retina? That's, that's yeah, one absolutely. thing I think. Yeah. Huge, a lot of huge. people are afraid to eat seafood for some reason. Well, I, I get, I have a lot of people that just don't like seafood. Uh, yeah. They're fearful of mercury. So, yes. you know, I think um, what you have to really understand is that the, the human brain evolved because of DHA. Okay. And DHA from seafood. Okay, and you can get DHA from, you know, algae, but, you know, it's a totally different form of DHA. So what's really important in the retina is it, the retinal hypothalamic tract, again, which is the, the connection between the retina and the hypothalamus suprachiasmatic nucleus, has more concentration of DHA in those, that, those nerve cells, ganglion cells, than anywhere in the body. And the reason for that is because you have to have a very true signal. It has to be perfectly timed and very true. And so DHA is, is, I would think about it like the copper wire that connects the cell to cell, okay? And so you have to have that transmission of information electrically from cell to cell. Without DHA, a proper amount of it, you're actually losing the fidelity of the system. Uh, and it's important for brain health, but it's really critically important for, for retina and the retinal hypothalamic circadian system. So DHA in the retina um, is, so there's a, a fast and a slow track. You have the absorption of, once DHA is used in the, in the um, photoreceptors, it's actually absorbed by uh, the retinal pigment the epithelium and then reprocessed. The, there's only, if you are constantly exposed to artificial blue light, two things happen you cycle vitamin A, you bleach vitamin A to the point that you, you don't have enough cis, trans, or cis uh, retinol to bind to opsins. And you also destroy DHA. 
So blue light destroys DHA processing in the retina. It also destroys the vitamin A cycle in the retina. And, and without those, you lose photoreceptors, you lose the fidelity of the transmission from the retina, not only from a visual standpoint, but also from a circadian standpoint. As far as DHA, I, I typically strongly encourage people to get used to eating seafood, um, whether that's shellfish, oysters, cold water fish, there are very healthy food sources for that. I, there's one, I have no financial interest in anything that I talk about, but there's a company called Vital Choice. Yes, I just ordered a ton of salmon roe yeah, from them. <laughs> have, have been using them for a while. They have very high quality stuff. Um, love them. I, I think yeah. that every everybody uh, need, especially the more Northern latitudes you live, particularly in the wintertime, the more seafood, the more DHA you need. And the reason for that is because your UV index is reduced. So you actually need uh, more of, of DHA to transmit the signal uh, because the higher energy from the UVA uh, is gonna be much better at a lower altitude. So you can get away with not eating as much DHA uh, the closer to the equator you get. You still need it, but you don't need as much. Cold and DHA in the winter time are, in my opinion, very important. Yeah. And do you like people eating organ meats for vitamin A or how do you think people Organ meats are amazing. If you can, yeah. if, you, if I can get my family to do it, we, I mean, we do, um, I hunt. So I do have a, we mainly eat wild game. Uh, I hunt wild boar, deer, uh, turkey. So we're typically eating uh, wild game, but I, I will usually get some of the, the organ meats it's hard to get kids the organ meats. Yeah, you got to blend them up in the meat yeah, grinder. Yeah, you don't really, <laughs> so you really need to put it in spaghetti or something. So yep. you know, I mean, eating kidney spaghetti uh, is, doesn't sound very good, but it's actually pretty good. And we put it in soups and stuff. Uh, we do like bone broth. Uh, you get some bone marrow made from the wild game. It's, it's pretty cool. But Yeah, we love bone marrow. I, I can get my daughter to eat bone marrow, but I have to give her the desiccated organ capsules to get yeah, her yeah, to yeah. <laughs> No, um, I think that's fantastic. And yeah, high vitamin A uh, foods like that are, and, and that's what most people don't understand. I mean, our ancestors ate every part of the, the animal. Yeah. Um, they is very, I mean, the organs were probably some of the most prized parts of it because they understood the nutritional value of those. Yep. Whereas the skeletal meats are actually, you know, not the best source of, of vitamin A and other you know, nutrients. Now, and I didn't put this on the list, but there's some people that say if you eat organ meats or take organ meat supplements, that you're going to become vitamin A toxic. My opinion is that I, th <laughs> I think that most people are probably really low in vitamin D if they do get into that. But <laughs> you're like, yeah, no. I mean, that's like say, I mean, I've had people tell me that you, if you get too much sun, you can become vitamin D toxic. Right, that's I've heard that too. Absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah. You have that that's what feedback loops in your system do. You have a system where uh, if you do become higher in vitamin D, your vitamin D receptor is going to reciprocate by with a feedback mechanism. You're never going to become vitamin D toxic if you make it naturally. You absolutely can if you're taking 10,000 international sense. units every day, right? So yeah. but not it, you, you can't overmake it naturally. Yeah. When my vitamin D level came back over a hundred this summer, my nurse totally flipped out on me. And I was like, I'm not taking supplements. I swear. This is just sunbathing. Like, and she's yeah. like, you've got to stop doing that. No, like, no. Yeah, no, no way. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, uh, yeah, anything that you can do naturally, uh, and you can make naturally, I'm all for it. Um, I, I, I really don't recommend a lot of supplements and pills. I think certain situations, and if you're trying to reverse something or short term, no problem. But anything, we didn't talk much about water, but you know, I, I think- Oh, I love um, talking about water. Water is another really critical, uh, you know, I have a, a post somewhere on the quantum nutrients and deuterium is one of those discussions that most people just kind of glaze over when you start talking yeah. about it, but it's really important. And I, I, I'm not so much into um, deuterium depleted water all the time, but I am into natural spring glacial water. Mm -hmm. We live, we have a deep water well on the property here that we get our water from. So water from the ground is much more safe for you. Uh, you know, depending on if there's been a lot of farming in the area that you have to worry about glyphosates, but I, I'm a big fan of natural spring water. I think the deuterium levels in those are more appropriate for us. And, you know, th that's a, that's a long discussion talking about deuterium, but you probably have had some 
some discussions on your podcast about that. Yeah, I did a 90 day deuterium depletion um, yeah. with light water. And I had one of the owners of light water come on and talk, yeah. but, and I thought it was awesome. Um, the whole depletion process, but I just think having good, clean water is super important. And I don't know if you know, um, Carrie Bennett, she's uh, in the quantum realm, but she has been teaching me a lot about easy water and structure. Like I make my own structured water. That's another thing. My husband's like, what the hell is she doing? Yeah. Cause yeah. I've got the, the spring water that we get delivered in glass. And then I put yep. it into a jar, put my red light on top red of light it. On it. Yeah. <laughs> and then I have a wand I just bought. It's an analemma wand and it's um, you stir it and structure it and then I'll right. drink it. And sometimes Absolutely. put a hydrogen tablet in it. Yeah, you've, like, you've read Pollock's work, I guess. It, yeah. 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 It's interesting. You yeah. know, it's funny after I read that book, it's been several years ago. My son was probably, I guess he was in like third grade, but anyway, second or third grade. So they're talking about the phases of water. Mm. And so they're talking about, you know, ice, vapor, and, uh, you know, liquid. And my son, read it, he said, well, what about the fourth phase? And the teacher was like, what? There's three phases <laughs> of water, son. What are you talking about? And so he's like, tell, no, no, my dad said there's a fourth phase. It's called easy water. And it, so anyway, I thought that was cute. I love it. And I mean, that's really where the whole EMF discussion, I feel like is important because when I start talking about EMFs, people's eyes glaze over, people get mad. And I'm like that there is actual science to show that EMF kills your, your easy water. It dehydrates yeah. you. Yeah, and it's, absolutely. yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, what's interesting to me, I think the, the two groups of people that I find are most receptive to the light Artificial light story and the EMF story are the older patients, people over 80 and, oh, wow. people, under, and people under 20. And, and I'm not really sure exactly why, but I find those in between. I don't know if it's because they're so busy and they're just, they, they love the technology because it makes their life more productive and easy. Mm -hmm. I think the older patients, because they didn't grow up with it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I have a, another story about my 90 plus year old patients. I, I interviewed all of them and it just kind of took, things from them and what's interesting is most of them live a quantum lifestyle without even knowing it just because that was the way they lived and you know just when you grow up in in a rural environment you grow your own food you're outdoors from sunrise to sunset you go to bed early you have no no technology that's what you do and it's just really the number of 90 plus year old patients that I have in my practice that live alone they're independent and they all say the same thing all those things that we're talking about they do anyway, because that's the way they were, uh, you know, they were raised. It's pretty yeah. fascinating. It is fascinating. I mean, just back getting back to where we came from. My mom grew up on a farm and they had an outhouse. She grew up in North Carolina on a farm with an outhouse. And now it's like, you know, it, we're in the city with all these conveniences and it's just, it's totally a different life. It really is. And people are just so much sicker now. And they, they never make that correlation between the oh, two. Yeah sicker yeah. much younger i mean it's much, it's much younger it's crazy the number of the amount of pathology that i see in 30 and 40 year olds now that 20 plus years ago when i started i i didn't see it until they were 70 is remarkable I, it's yeah. it, nobody has any explanation for it in the traditional medicine but you know from my paradigm in the quantum world i see it and i and i understand it um, I just wish I could get more people to kind of wake up. It's like an unplug from the matrix and let's look yep. at this from reality. Yeah, that's my, you know, women my age, just like thyroid, hormone, early menopause, all these things. And I'm like, just because it's common doesn't mean it's normal. No, we, right. shouldn't, when, we shouldn't accept this. When I had gotten into my early forties and my doctor's like, well, you might just be going into menopause early. I was like, oh, the hell I'm not. <laughs> like, no, I'm not. Right. I'm not yeah. doing that. And I didn't, and everything is good and regular now, but I had to do a lot of things. And so that's why this information is important because we're just going to be told by a lot of professionals and other people, well, it's, it's normal. Cause it's just common. Yeah. It's happening oh, so much more often now. All the so, time. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. And with, you know, just like they don't have an explanation for why, you know, Alzheimer's increasing exponentially oh. macular yeah. degeneration, you know, all the neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, autism. I mean, every single one of those is a mitochondrial dysfunction. Yeah. And the degree of mitochondrial heteroplasmy or dysfunction that you have will ultimately dictate the severity of the disease that you get. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I've said this on other podcasts with other doctors before, but 
you know, my daughter, when she was little and we had to try to start finding therapies for her, I was just shocked because everything was full. Everything had a waiting list a year long. And I'm like, kids that don't speak that have autism this severe. I never saw any children like that growing up. I was never, I didn't even, I never saw one kid like that in my whole high school. And now there's waiting lists to do all kinds of therapies. Cause there's so many kids right. like her. And I'm like that, <laughs> what in the hell is going on guys? Like, this is yeah. not okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we, I think we know, I think the problem is getting the mainstream uh, physicians to be educated about it. And yeah, it, it's, it's a, I, I've got probably about four or five physicians that I've, I've talked to, you know, in depth over the last few years and more and more people are waking up to it, which is, yeah. is good. But it's a, unfortunately, like with everything we've seen the last two years, um, it's hard for physicians to break out of their training and the, the guidelines, the official guidelines. And Big Pharma is controlling pretty much the narrative in healthcare now. And yeah. so anything outside of that, if it doesn't have a pill, uh, nobody wants to talk about it. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Well, um, I did have one more question. I know we've been going for a while now. Yeah, okay. um, a couple of people um, from my groups had asked um, if early morning sunrise and sun viewing can help improve eyesight yes. and um, can it reverse cataracts that are in an early stage also? Okay. Yeah. For, uh, question one, absolutely. It's probably one of the things that I probably tell patients to do most often, uh, particularly people that have uh, glaucoma, macular degeneration, dry eyes, Morning and evening sun are probably two of the most important uh, physiologic effects on the eye. There are some studies in process looking at infrared light treatment for certain eye diseases. I don't really want to comment yet on those because the protocols haven't been out. I don't necessarily want people to go and just stare at their EMR tech um, because I, I do think that there's, there's some potential over, overexposure there. But I do, I think we're going to have some information on infrared light treatment. But for now, the, it's totally safe to go and watch a sunrise and a sunset. And that is, there's a lot of infrared light in that and no UV. And so I think it's important to do that. It absolutely is beneficial for the retina, uh, for the optic nerve, the, the ganglion cells of the optic nerve. And as far as cataracts are concerned, I don't have any data that you can reverse a cataract with, with uh, light. But I do think very, very much so that morning and evening sun can slow the progression, okay? Um, there's some evidence, obviously, you can, just like your skin can get overexposed to UV in the sun, your eyes can too. And so I think for people that are in the sun all day, every day, do, does that increase the incidence of cataract? Yes, okay? Does artificial light staring at screens? I think that's more likely Worse, with, yeah. uh, because most of my elderly patients, you know, because they can't get outside as much, they can't walk, they whatever, they're watching TV and computers all day, every day. Mm -hmm. So most of them don't get a lot of sun exposure unless I tell them they need to. And I'll have, you know, hopefully get somebody over to their house to help them get outside. And, you know, that that's a process that I think all of us need to be thinking about. But morning and evening sun, maybe the most important light environment that your eyes can see. And, and then with intermittent exposure to UV during the middle of the day. Absolutely. I agree. And, you know, I, I had started having some vision issues earlier this year. I was looking at the TV and I realized I couldn't see the words across the room. I was like, oh crap. Well, this is what happened to my parents. But at then I started doing sunrise, started wearing my blue blockers. And now yeah. a year later, I can see perfectly like that has completely reversed itself. So I don't well, feel like I, I need to go get a prescription now. <laughs> well, there's, there's some physiology behind that. There's several studies looking at uh, particularly young people, adolescents, uh, screen time, artificial light. So it increases myopia. And the reason for that is because in your retina, uh, the dopamine is important for eye elongation. So when you actually don't have enough UV and you get artificial light, your dopamine in the retina gets depleted and the eyes elongate. So if every, there's hundreds of studies looking at, they, they don't really understand why, but for kids who get outside more, they have a marked reduction in their myopia progression. 
Uh, whereas kids who's on screens all the time have a, a massive progression in myopia. And we're seeing just an epidemic of myopia. Most, most eye surgeons think, well, great, I have more LASIK to do down the road. I don't view it that way. Myopia is a disease that can lead to retinal detachment, maculopathy. Uh, and so I think that we need to be addressing it early and trying to slow it down, maybe even reverse it in early stages. Yeah, I agree. We just got to keep spreading the news about all this stuff. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, where can people find you if they want to follow your work? And, and I know you stay busy with your practice and your family. Yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter. Um, it's Montgomery MD and my uh, little thing is sjacobm321, um, at sjacobm321. I'm also on Facebook, uh, just J Montgomery. Um, and I do, I post things. I think most of the time on um, on Twitter, you know, I, I don't I don't mind answering questions as long as it's not you know specifically clinical about a particular patient. Uh, in general, I can answer those questions and things. Um, my goal eventually, uh, I want to exit the uh, traditional healthcare system. Um, I have some interest in writing. I need to, I need to write. I got a couple books I need to write. I'd like to do some some more of this, uh, more YouTube videos, and. You know, I've got to get to the point where I've got all the kids colleges paid for and I've got three marriages, uh, weddings to plan for for my, my daughters, but I'll get there eventually and I'd love to do more of this um, travel speak, uh, get this word out there and fight the traditional healthcare system. I love it. And is there anything that I didn't ask you that you think is really important for anybody watching to know. You know, I think probably as long as people understand that everything in health now, in my opinion, is mitochondria related. And so if you start and finish every day trying to make decisions that are going to improve your mitochondria, you're going to be so far ahead of the rest of your, your peers that, and that's where the light environment is probably the number one, it's called Zeitgeber. So these are just environmental influences on our physiology. Light's the most strong Zeitgeber or lever that we have. And so if you can use it properly, that's the biggest step. And food's important, exercise is important, cold thermogenesis is good if you wanna try that, water's important, but light is at the top of the totem pole. I agree. I agree. Awesome. Well, that is a wonderful note to close up the top of the discussion. So thank you so much for being here and talking with Absolutely. me today. My yeah. pleasure. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks a lot.